new area to explore in the Maxine field. Okay, great. Jump in. Okay, jump in. After your talk, I think it will be 10 times larger for the Maxine groups. Yeah, so this is really, really great. Okay, yeah, well, so proud of you, Yuri. I have this certification. Yeah, it's honorable I can talk to have you, a silver speaker, top scientist, you know, everything. Yeah. I'm taking so, this virtual certificate. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> That's for you, Yuri. Uh, I'm so proud. Yeah, you know, here, yeah, we not only have Yuri, we still have, uh, you know, several of your groups, yeah, people here. Because you, uh, you mentioned that today is a special day. It's for ACS Nano, <laughs> IKX Cox. So, yeah, so all your colleagues here. And uh, first, uh, I want to, you know, uh, introduce, uh, ask you a question, Yuri, uh, waiting for Paul and Yan to turn on the, you know, uh, Paul, could you turn on, yeah, cameras, get everyone on this? First, I want to ask Yuri a question. Yuri, you go around the world, you know, yeah. So from Europe, Japan, US, and everything. So what different kind of experience do you have and how to you know, make you so successful? Yeah, when you are young, what you did? <laughs> well, you know, like, it's always excitement about science. When I was uh, a student, high school student, I was in a chemistry club. I participated uh -huh. in chemistry Olympiads. After graduation from the university, I wanted to see the world. I wanted to see how scientists in the best labs work. I went to Germany. After that, I went to Japan to see how Japanese were making at the time the best functional materials. I was looking for the best teams, best researchers, and was driven by this excitement of discovery. And this is what I would recommend to junior scientists here. Follow your heart. Uh, do whatever you like, whatever you love, whatever you're excited about, and discoveries will come. Wow, cool. What a nice story. Yeah, do what you like. Do, you know, what's in your dream. And uh, yeah, I'm so proud to have you here, you know, ACS Nano Group, the top group. Yeah, is my colleague in Peking University and the chemistry school. Yeah, she is so famous, you know, everyone says that in the chemistry school, the professor, everyone, a leading professor. Yeah, so yeah, as a female professor, a top scientist, so can you show us some uh, uh, experience, you know, for the female to get to uh, grow up to be a, uh, you know, senior scientist to be get to the top group? Well, thank you, Alice. Um... Uh, frankly speaking, doing doing research is something really magic. But to be a female scientist, a woman scientist, is not is not that magic at all. <laughs> <laughs> I fully agree with Yuri. I just uh, have uh, has some similar not experience but similar feeling or similar uh, similar uh, similar idea. So mm, just uh, let me I uh, just uh, see. It is not that that strange at all for a woman to be a scientist. Just uh, like a a normal teacher, a doctor, an artist, women can do that. That means women can also become a scientist, right? So actually, I feel women even have uh, some strengths uh, in doing science. For example, women uh, in nature are more curious. Yeah. And uh, normally they are careful, collaborative, good at communication. All those strengths are very helpful for women to uh, grow up to be a scientist. So if you have a dream to become a scientist, just follow your heart, work hard toward your uh, dream, then it will become true. Wow, great. Yeah, <laughs> we will follow your uh, dream. Yeah, we're glad to see. Okay, Paul, our editor-in-chief of this top journal, ACS Nano, now is ranking, you know, in the top 18, right? Yeah, it's a totally the yeah. science of journals. Mm -hmm. I'm so proud all of journals in all fields and number one yeah. in Nano. Thanks. So, Paul, any you know words for you know ACS Nano get on this stage and for the well, young generations? Well, I'll echo what uh, Yuri and Jan said. I think when you choose a research project, you want to choose something that is exciting for you to get out of bed in the morning, and so you <laughs> want to choose something where you're motivated every day. And uh, 
and that uh, in, in for students and postdocs uh, choosing as advisors who they uh, mesh with and who you know who have opportunities in those areas that's much more important than uh, for instance choosing a famous uh, mentor you really want to choose a project where you'll make headway uh, because that's what you care about so. okay yeah so I'll say one of the things you know, one of the things we're missing by not being able to travel around the world, we, we, Alice, we really appreciate you uh, putting this together. Uh, I think so far I have 18 consecutive trips canceled. And uh, one of the things that, uh, that I miss when I go to new places is uh, meeting the young faculty and uh, students and postdocs all over the world. The senior people, we get to see each other and we have friends that, that span the entire world. But, uh, you know, the, the, seeing what people's ideas are as they're starting their labs or thinking about starting their labs. Uh, that's something that's uh, maybe the biggest loss uh, in this, you know, in this time. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, we have, you know, all these uh, ACS nanos, the editors here, they are going to, you know, have one very special gift to, you know, the young generations. So, huh. We will announce that, okay? Yes, please. Yeah. yeah, everyone. Yeah, let's see. That's the first, you know, special lectures I can ask Hux. So, Paul, please. Yes. So, what we thought we would do is take rising stars around the world in in nanoscience and let them share what their plans are. Uh, we thought they'd be a great example for uh, students uh, and postdocs and and all their uh, colleagues, including us, uh, for where they see the world and the opportunities. Uh, much as Yuri said, how to enter uh, the field of vaccines, choose the, the applications and fundamental science that you're excited about. Uh, we're picking, uh, with Alice's help and the editors of ACS Nano, uh, scientists from, from all over uh, who we think have a vision of the field, inviting them to give an ICANN lecture and uh, some of them will also be writing up uh, their thoughts and perspectives for ACS Nano. So we're, we're delighted to announce the first three uh, lecturers, uh, Miso Kim, uh, Wei Gao, and Nanshu Liu, who will all be speaking on uh, June 12th in this forum. So congratulations wow. to our uh, rising stars and uh, thank you for uh, Alice for, for helping us uh, put this opportunity together and for showcasing the the rising stars of the world. Okay, great. Yeah, that's our first special. We need to do something celebration. Could we do that cup? Yeah, everyone have that? We cheers for mm -hmm. this collaborations. Yeah, please. Yeah. Cheers. Okay, cheers. Yes. <laughs> yeah, for all this writing cheers. We're cheers. really excited. Want to have all of you. Yeah, on the stage. Yeah, what a nice day. You know, a May day. I think now we move to the second half, you know, is the lectures of a pop. So yeah, you will yes. be the hosters. So now, yeah, the stage is yours, please. Okay, thank you, Alice. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, make a brief introduction about Dr. Paul Weiss. Uh, Dr. Paul Weiss is an influential nanoscientist in the world. He holds a UC presidential chair and is a distinguished professor of chemistry, bioengineering, and material science and at the University of uh, California, Los Angeles. He has won numerous awards in science, engineering, teaching, publishing, and communications. He is a fellow of the American Acad Acad uh, Academy of uh, Arts and Sciences, AAAS, ACS, MRS, AIMB, APS, AVS, Canadian Academy, uh, uh, Academy <laughs> Sorry, Canadian Academy of uh, Engineering is also a, an honorary fellow of the Chinese, Chinese Chemical Society. Most importantly, he is the editor in chief of ACES Nano. He initiated this journal and brought it from a baby to nowadays a giant in nanoscience and technology. Uh, let's welcome uh, Professor Paul Weiss to deliver his talk. Uh, yes, Paul, please. Thank you so much. Let's get the uh, sharing going here. Okay. 
and there we go. Blue. And is that showing up correctly? Okay, well, we'll assume it is. Uh, so what I thought I'd do today is tell uh, three stories about how we've applied uh, nanoscience and nanotechnology to biology and medicine. Uh, but uh, before I get started with that, I just wanted to uh, point out that, that this, uh, this series has really uh, brought the world together. Uh, this was a meeting uh, of the IEEE uh, nano uh, division uh, that we had in Macau last year, and I thought Alice's title uh, was uh, particularly appropriate for Alice. So uh, Alice, thank you for, for doing this for us and uh, getting us all uh, together on this forum. Uh, again, congratulations to our three first uh, Rising Star uh, lecturers uh, and stay tuned for more. So now back to the story. Uh, so my uh, world started in nanoscience with building a low temperature scanning tunneling microscope and by uh, learning to manipulate atoms and trying to measure the vibrational spectroscopy of parts of molecules. We moved over to surface functionalization and I'll show you just a couple of very brief snapshots of that. But over time, what we found was that because we learned to functionalize surfaces selectively from the scale of a fraction of a molecule all the way out to the wafer scale, that that had uh, uses and applications in, in biology and medicine, first as identified by Professor Ann Andrews, uh, later by Steve Jonas, and later by others. So what I'll do is I'll tell you the stories of those three collaborations, uh, which are very much uh, progress reports, uh, rather than you know you won't see uh, uh, you know a big punchline uh, at the end of a story. I'll also add that uh, May first is the anniversary of my becoming a professor, so it's a special opportunity uh, to be able to give this talk uh, today in that celebration. Uh, the first. The first uh, story is going to be involving uh, developing a biosensor rays using selective functionalization and the placement of individual molecules on surfaces. It was really motivated uh, by the goals of uh, Professor Ann Andrews, who uh, started her career at the National Institute of Mental Health as part of NIH, and Hello. then moved to Penn State, and then moved here to UCLA uh, when Hi. I did. Please turn your slides to the play model. Pardon? Yeah, now it's a double screen. Please use a play model for your PPT. Is that one? Sorry, that's what I was asking earlier. Does that work better? Uh, no, uh, yeah, now it's better. Thank okay, you. very good, sorry about that. And can you see the pointer? Yeah, I see that. Very good, okay, so sorry about that. Yep, uh, switched around from our earlier, uh, our earlier check. Okay. So we, uh, we uh, started uh, working together and as you'll see, that's been a very uh, productive uh, collaboration that's brought in a number of other uh, people over time. Uh, the uh, next part involves uh, the capture of circulating tumor cells, exosomes and viruses uh, as uh, led by H.R. Tsang at, at UCLA and also in collaboration with uh, Namjoon Cho at uh, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And then uh, the, uh, uh, the third uh, section is involving uh, Steve Jonas, who's a pediatric hematology oncology a faculty member at UCLA, uh, but started off uh, earlier as a postdoc in the laboratory and brought a series of challenges to us. And that'll also be one of the themes of the talk is uh, taking on uh, interesting challenges. Much as you heard Yuri say, uh, in terms of choosing something you're excited about. Steve shared his excitement and really recruited us uh, into this uh, project together. Okay, now, again, before we get started, at the 10th anniversary of the National Nanotechnology Initiative in the US, we were asked to say what it is that in our field we'd done with more than 1 billion US dollars per year uh, for the first 10 years. And if that funding were to continue, then 
what would we do in the second decade? And that we felt was an important question to answer. And when we uh, went and, and looked at it, we realized that you know, on the one hand in nanoscience, we can target atomically precise structures. After all, we can move atoms around, uh, we can combine chemistry and supermolecular assembly and lithographies of various sorts in order to, in order to make those structures. On the other hand, even when we make those structures precise, we find that function varies. If you do the same measurement on exactly the same structure over and over, you find that you get a different answer. And that heterogeneity is intrinsic to uh, the world, to the, to the nanoscale world, and in particular to biology, and that there are all kinds of opportunities uh, based on these, the playoff of these two uh, aspects. And we wrote that up uh, for a piece in ACS Nano at the time. Uh, the other thing we realized was uh, that we could use the biotechnology revolution uh, for inspiration and guidance in identifying problems and developing new tools to address those that we, we felt that the, the new tools had enabled the opening of nanoscience and nanotechnology. And that if we kept asking questions and kept developing ways to answer them, that that would have, uh, that would open a world of other possibilities. We also realized uh, something that, that hadn't occurred to us uh, before at all, and that was because of the way nanoscience came about from chemists getting together with physicists, getting together with engineers, getting together with clinicians, getting together with toxicologists and so forth, that we had taught each other communication skills and we'd adopted each other's problems and we'd adopted each other's approaches. And that had not happened in other fields. You might think that fields such as neuroscience, as an example, would do that because in order to understand the brain, you would want to understand the chemistry, the physics, the biology, the engineering, the data science and so forth. But for whatever reason, nanoscience and nanotechnology were unique in having pulled people together and you'll see the results of, of those kinds of discussions uh, in the talk today. You know, I'll point out that, that that kind of collaboration can go very far. This was part of a collaboration we had with the writer and director of Kung Fu Panda, John Stevenson, who while he graduated, he didn't graduate from high school, he with the best experiments that we had in, in uh, uh, the uh, work that we did together. Uh, uh, again, referring to uh, Yuri's comment earlier and Jan's, uh, it's possible to take on problems uh, that you're excited about and to put teams together. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But if you're interested in particular uh, at how, on how one might do that, have a look at this piece that Rami Aklu now at, at uh, the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, Ali Kadamuseni, who runs the Terasaki Institute here, and I wrote a couple of years ago. Uh, for ACS Nano. Okay, so I came into this world uh, in developing the ability to measure individual atoms. Uh, we learned how to move them. That was my, my last uh, four days uh, when I worked at IBM before I started my academic career. And to me, the most important image ever recorded was this one, uh, where uh, Randy Feenstra and Joe Strosio, then both at IBM Yorktown Heights, were able to image and overlay uh, gallium and arsenic atoms that were on the stoichiometric gallium arsenide 110 surface. They were able to look at where the electrons are, and they were able to look at the empty orbitals, and knowing about the charge transfer from gallium to arsenic on that surface, know that the empty orbitals were, were where the gallium atoms were and the, the arsenic atoms were where the electrons, where the electron orbitals were filled. So it became, uh, you know, the idea was that it's as if we could put on goggles and look at the surface the way that an atom or, or part of a molecule roaming around on it would, and, and it was an ideal tool uh, for a chemist. But then even beyond uh, the ability to measure uh, structure and spectra locally, uh, we learned that we could move atoms into position and that we had this ability to control at the atomic scale 
uh, you know, individual atoms. And then we also learn to uh, use other tools and develop other strategies uh, to place atoms and molecules where we want it. And so uh, my, uh, my efforts when I began my uh, career at, at Penn State uh, focused on developing that, that chemical dimension of nanolithography, uh, placing molecules where we wanted them, isolating even individual pairs and seeing the reactions of individual molecules and pairs of molecules, looking at the interactions of individual molecules with light, looking at motion at the very smallest scales and trying to understand, for instance, how nature could have more than 99% efficiency in some cases of converting chemical energy to motion, but there was nothing that humans could make at any scale that came even close to that. And then along the way, we developed the means to control chemical functionality uh, simultaneously from that submolecular scale all the way out to the wafer scale. And it was, it was really a, a set of projects uh, driven by a curiosity uh, rather than a, any application or goal. Uh, and so, for instance, uh, we learned to control the defects in the self sum model layers. I'm not going to talk about these in any detail, but just say that in a single molecular layer, we're able to change the chemical, physical, and biological properties of surfaces. And the reason we're able to learn to control the placement of molecules was that we learned to understand the defects in these films and control the access of molecules from solution vapor or contact because of the invention of the scanning tunneling microscope, thanks to Heine Rohr, Rick Binning, and Christoph Gerber. These self sum monolayers were first developed by uh, Dave Valera and Ralph Nuzzo. Uh, Ralph's mentor, George Whitesides, uh, later uh, picked those up. And we really went to town in isolating individual molecules for study with the scanning tunneling microscope, like if you've seen the movie Love Actually, the Bill Nye character, uh, sitting here. So we could position our microscope over him and we could watch him uh, sing and dance. Okay, so really the, the ability to understand how we could drive molecules to where we wanted them came from having those eyes. And once we had those, we asked further questions such as what are what are the structures of the molecules? What are the tilt angles? Developing this technique was about a 20 year project in my laboratory, eventually brought to fruition uh, by uh, Patrick Hahn and others in the group. Uh, we then learned to place individual functional molecules and we learned to study, for instance, their motion, their connectivity to the surface and so forth. And then we learned to pattern hierarchically where we could make patches where we had individual molecules uh, put in place. And then uh, further on down the line, we learned to attach and to tether individual biomolecules that could be used to capture other, capture targets uh, from solution. And that's where uh, the next story picks up. Uh, before I go on though, I'll say uh, one of the things that made me move to UCLA uh, a little over 10 years ago was uh, the proximity of science, engineering, and medicine. We're all right around one courtyard here, the California Nanosystems Institute, uh, which I uh, came here to join, uh, really combines all three with about a third science, third engineering, a third medicine. And I think UCLA is the only place with that proximity of all three uh, subjects at the, at the quality that we have and the ability to interact, which we do. There's another aspect of UCLA that I wanted to point out, which is, uh, I, I think it's the creative center of the world. And there's pressure on us as faculty, as postdocs, as students and staff to do something crazy in our laboratories. And if you're not going on a limb, if you're not doing that, you're not doing your job. And the advantage of that is if you succeed, then people say, wow, how did you ever think of that? And on the other side, if you fail and your crazy project doesn't work, nobody ever hears about it. So that's an additional lesson I would say is that there's no downside to trying something that's difficult, challenging, or maybe a little crazy when you're in uh, science or engineering. Okay, so this ability to functionalize surfaces was uh, 
was seen by uh, Professor Ann Andrews, uh, my colleague at the time, and she suggested uh, that we uh, collaborate in order to work on her project, which was to try and measure the chemical signaling in the brain to figure out how the cells, how the neurons uh, talk to one another to understand what a thought is, what a memory is, and the difference between function and malfunction in healthy versus diseased brains or animal models of disease. And so the, the uh, first uh, requirement was to be able to build sensors at the single cell scale that could measure those molecules. There were already measurements that could do electrical, look at the voltages uh, in the brain that were shrinking in scale, but the time scale and length scales of chemical sensors were both many orders of magnitude too large for what uh, one would need to measure uh, you know, to, to uh, really hit her goal. And as you'll see, there are a number of other targets uh, once we had that technology in place uh, that are interesting and uh, useful. And after we moved to uh, UCLA, uh, I was asked to help put together a panel uh, for the Obama White House uh, in which we looked in nanoscience and nanotechnology, what big challenges uh, could be taken on, which would make a, you know, capture the public imagination, uh, justify our uh, continued existence and funding uh, as a field and all the support uh, that we'd received to date. And a number of other fields were asked to do this as well. So for instance, the computer scientists had come up with some very successful projects that did get uh, support, but they they didn't they weren't really useful in terms of making the case for science uh, to the country and to the world. Who, after all, the public are the people who pay uh, for what we do. Uh, the astrophysicist came up with the idea of dragging an asteroid into Earth orbit uh, for study, uh, and the nanoscientists and nanotechnologists really adopted uh, Professor Andrews' idea that the brain's always been nano, and that we had this accidental coincidence between the scale of semiconductor technology, uh, say 10 nanometer gates in current transistor devices in our uh, computers and cell phones and so forth, and the synapse scale of function. After all, the nano scale is the scale of function in biology. And so as a group, we, we argued for the idea that we should combine nano and neuro and that we should go after these measurements of how neural circuits functioned and how they didn't. But then we got in an argument within the group that was fought out in the literature in which the engineers and physicists uh, said, well, it's all voltages and the brain's a computer. Why don't we just go ahead and measure all the voltages and then we'll be done. And uh, we argued that we have these hundred chemical dimensions of interpenetrating and heterogeneous networks that we really needed to understand those if we were ever to understand how the brain worked and how it failed. And, and really the institute directors of the National Institutes of Health uh, came to uh, the side of, if you don't measure the, the chemistry and the chemical signaling in the brain, then they wouldn't be supportive. And that's when everyone got on board and we uh, developed what eventually became called the Brain Initiative. We actually had another name for it earlier, but the night before the announcement in the White House, uh, President Obama changed the name. Uh, he's allowed to do that. <laughs> and uh, we had already published the technology roadmap in ACS Nano for that, laying out what we would need to do with a heavy emphasis on technology development. And going back to biotechnology, that was really inspired by the Human Genome Project in which the last three years of the project really made all the difference when instead of going brute force at the problem, the technology of rapid sequencing uh, was developed. And that's, I would say, the biggest impact of the Human Genome Project is now we can you know, have our own genome sequenced, we can have uh, different species sequenced, we can look at the heterogeneity we talked about earlier and so forth. And we saw that as the primary success of the Genome Project. And so we said, technology should be up front. Okay, so 
here was Professor Andrews' idea was that we would have electronic devices, uh, transistors put into arrays that would have artificial receptors that would allow us to detect those hundred different neurotransmitters and to understand uh, how the, the brain was communicating using these uh, chemical signaling molecules. And we particularly uh, focused on DNA aptamers. So these are DNA molecules that are selected from libraries of trillions of possibilities such that they'll change conformation when they recognize their target. And because we have to do these measurements in the brain, the electronics come into play very closely here. So the way that these transistors work is if there's a changing charge on the surface, just like the gate in a traditional semiconductor device, then that will, uh, that will change the conductance of the channel and we can detect that with very great sensitivity. But the problem is our bodies are salty. So if you look at electronic sensors in biology, those are essentially always in the laboratory, never in vivo. And so what people do is they dilute the salt out or remove it selectively before they do that detection. But it turns out it's not a good idea to dilute your brain. And so we needed to come up with a method that would work sensitively in, uh, in the brain in vivo uh, and not be disturbed by those high salt concentrations. And in fact, the screening length in the brain uh, and in vivo is about a nanometer, the Debye length. And so that's the scale at which we had to make sure that the, the detecting molecules uh, would work. And so enzymes are larger than that. And those, you know, if we functionalize the transistor uh, channels with those, that wouldn't work. Likewise, antibodies that can work in the laboratory uh, would not work in vivo. And the aptamers, particularly the ones designed by our collaborator Milan Stojanovic at Columbia University are designed such that there are conformational changes that take place very close to the surface and that allow us to do the detection that I described. And I'll point out this work was led by our graduate student, Nako Nakatsuka, who's now a postdoc at ETH in Zurich. Okay, along the way, as I mentioned, we also developed lithographic methods. And so uh, one of them involved using polymer stamps. If those of you are familiar with microcontact printing, it's a derivative of that in which we make the stamp reactive and we're able to pull off the molecules that are forming the monolayer initially on the surface and rip them off with a stamp. And that gives us the ability to pattern entire wafers at a time with uh, chemical, uh, you know, and, and replace the uh, uh, molecules on those with the uh, semiconductors that will further functionalize. There are a lot of other interesting uses of these uh, that we won't have a chance to talk about uh, today. Okay, then uh, we use the sol gel chemistry that our uh, colleague at UCLA, Yang Yang, who's uh, currently Dean of Engineering at Westlake University. Uh, we, we hope he uh, comes back after that uh, to UCLA. Uh, we used his sol gel chemistry to make the transistors on the surface and we got better semiconductor properties than we really had any right to expect. And the, this part of the project was before we'd started working with Milan Stojanovic. And so we used an, an aptamer for the neurotransmitter dopamine that was known in the literature, but had a problem. And that problem is it had cross-reactivity with norepinephrine. And so it wouldn't be useful as a real sensor but it is useful as a test that it's functioning properly as an aptamer because we should see then sensitivity both to dopamine and to a lesser extent norepinephrine, which we did. So this was a proof of principle experiment, but not a useful sensor. And then we also saw at the time that we could build arrays of these uh, sensors. And so ultimately that would be advantageous for us as we as we develop the arrays that we wanted to put in vivo. Okay. Enter Milan, and he was able to develop much more selective and sensitive aptamers. When we did the experiments in the laboratory in full 
ion, ionic strength uh, buffers, such as phosphate buffered saline or an artificial cerebrospinal fluid, we saw that we had sensitivity down to the femtomolar range, which is actually more sensitive than we would need uh, in the brain. And we also had uh, sensitivity over about six orders of magnitude, which is a consequence of the logarithmic sensitivity of the transistor. And so he developed uh, a series of aptamers for serotonin, for another neurotransmitter, dopamine. Uh, we were able to show that these were selective. We don't have the structures of the aptamers uh, before and after capture. Uh, these are just uh, schematics, cartoons of, of what we believe is happening. But you'll see these aptamers actually function in different ways. The signal goes up with increasing serotonin concentration and the signal goes down for increasing dopamine concentration. And we believe that's a consequence of the conformational changes of the aptamers. We have some independent ways to measure and to predict uh, which way the aptamers are moving, which you can read about in this paper that we published uh, almost a year and a half ago now. Uh, we also uh, compared the old dopamine aptamer to the more sensitive and selective current one, and those work in the opposite directions as well. We've been able to show selectivity, and I think uh, Professor Andrews will be talking about this in a future I can X talk, so I won't uh, uh, take that further. In the paper, uh, we described how we went to homogenized mouse brain. So this is a, a mouse that se selectively cannot produce serotonin, so that if you take part of its brain and spike in uh, some serotonin, you can measure the sensitivity. You can see that our sensitivity is now shifted into this higher uh, picomolar uh, nanomolar range, which is actually the useful uh, range. So we didn't even have to vary the aptamers in order to adjust the sensitivity. And I just want to point out Chuan Zhen Zhao, who's going to be the one translating uh, this uh, talk over the next couple of days, uh, has been working to take these sensors in vivo and has been uh, leading the charge uh, with the uh, first measurements inside a live behaving mice uh, shown here. And you'll hear about that more uh, from his uh, thesis and publications as well as uh, Professor Andrews' talk. Now, we were also able to show that we could take these sensors and that we could put them on flexible substrates such that we could make temporary tattoos as you I heard about in John Rogers' uh, inaugural ICANX lecture a couple of weeks ago, uh, put them in uh, contact lenses and so forth uh, to do uh, sensitive uh, measurements. And I believe you'll also be hearing from uh, Ali Javi in the coming weeks, but certainly Wei Gao, uh, one of his uh, mentees as one of the rising stars, uh, talking about work related to these uh, efforts and all the things that we might be able to do uh, with wearable sensors. Okay. Uh, we've also, uh, right at the end of last year, 2018, I guess, yeah, uh, we showed that uh, we, can, we can measure other interesting molecules uh, such as uh, phenylalanine to which phenylketonurics are sensitive. And uh, particularly interesting here is there are really three different types of aptamers uh, that Milan Stojanovic developed all of which have uh, different properties and then uh, advantages in their use. And we've been able to show, again, the specificity there. So if you're interested, I'll refer you to this uh, ACS sensors uh, paper. Okay. Well, there are other places these kinds of sensors uh, can be of use. For instance, in the microbiome, uh, the same species and different species talk to one another. Uh, there are signaling molecules uh, that we'd like to be able to detect both to tell the presence of individual species, but also to understand how they interact. And when it came time for the uh, development of the third big initiative uh, from the White House, uh, the, the microbiome initiative, uh, there was a comparison between the first two. So we talked about the brain initiative, and I think you had probably heard about that already. There was a second one called precision medicine. And the people who developed that one were really from that field and never encouraged others, were never so open to bringing in uh, people with other approaches and other techniques 
and it was viewed as less successful than the BRAIN initiative. And so the leadership of the microbiome initiative, uh, particularly uh, Joe Handelsman, who's now back at the University of Wisconsin, uh, looked at what was different between the BRAIN initiative and the precision medicine initiative and decided that the difference was nanoscientists, that we had brought together, we'd used our communication skills, we'd look for who could be useful to the initiative and to us, and we'd been inclusive in pulling people in, and thus they asked us to lead and to develop the technology roadmap uh, for the microbiome initiative, uh, which you see we published later in uh, ACS Nano. And uh, that, that piece that we wrote, uh, we, we found later had encouraged other countries to develop microbiome initiatives, had started divisions of companies uh, that were interested in the field. And so we're, we're very happy to uh, be able to have that impact in you know, measuring the, the uh, microbiome on and in us, in the ocean and the atmosphere, uh, in the dirt and so forth. And that project uh, continues to this day around the world. Okay, now. Uh, we're also going to go back in time uh, once again. So we've gotten very good at placing molecules where we wanted them on flat surfaces, but we were, you know, uh, the scanning Charlie microscope required very flat uh, surfaces. We've been able to translate that from metals to semiconductors, but we wanted to take on additional challenges. And so we thought, where else is the placement of molecules important? And we thought, well, lipid bilayer membranes, those you know, control the, the traffic in and out of cells, for instance, and between cells. Could we, we asked, could we develop the tools we needed to place molecules where we wanted them and to know where they were within the lipid bilayer membranes? And so we took that on and the simplest way that we thought to control the placement of molecules was curvature of the membranes in these giant unilamellar vesicles. And the simplest way we could think to measure them was with fluorescence. And so we did that and we published it in the Journal of Biological Physics. And about a year later, Watt Webb at Cornell did essentially the same thing, but with much more beautiful images and greater control and published that in Nature. And that became a bit of a theme in our work in that you know, we were able to do some demonstrations, but it didn't get a lot of attention and it looked like other people were going to be able to do the same thing ultimately. We have a rule in our laboratory that we only want to do things that other people cannot. And so if someone's going to do something anyway, uh, they can have it. We did encourage others uh, of our colleagues in, uh, in trying to gain this control and gain this measurement. And Andy Ewing and Nick Winograd uh, down the hall from me at the time uh, showed the placement of molecules with secondary mass spectrometry in these mating cells and that there were uh, different, there was different chemistry in these junctions than elsewhere. And uh, we developed a whole series of ways of measuring the, controlling and measuring the shapes of vesicles. For instance, we could uh, optically trap uh, beads that were inside the vesicles. We do micro pet, pet aspiration, or my particular favorite was growing microtubules inside so we get very high curvature at what looked like the planet Saturn from the side with the rings like this. Uh, these, it's just a line though, not a ring, uh, where there's high curvature here, zero curvature along one dimension, and high curvature along others, negative curvature and normal curvature, all in the same system. We were able to use this one to trigger the degradation of the microtubule with radical uh, sources that we put into the membrane and show that we could reproduce the biological morphology of neurons as they died in, in uh, neurodegenerative diseases without some of the proteins that were thought to be necessary. And that was actually the first paper that uh, Professor Andrews and I published together. It was on the cover of uh, PNAS. And if you look closely at Big Bang, show Big Bang Theory, it's apparently on the wall of Amy Farrah Fowler's apartment, although we don't know if it was ever on camera. So if you do find it, please let us know. Okay. As I said, other people were, were picking up uh, this field and doing a really brilliant job, such as uh, Jay Groves at uh, Berkeley, looking at how T-cells interact with 
uh, chemically patterned surfaces. And so the very last experiment we did before we stopped this part of the laboratory was done by uh, Susan Gilmore, a postdoc in the laboratory who's now at the NIH. And what she was interested in was what happened to red blood cells as they passed through capillaries and were deformed. And so what she did was she recapitulated the shape of the red blood cell and then mechanically distorted it. And to our surprise, she found that pores opened up in the vesicles and remained open for minutes. And she was able to show how big they were and how long they were open. And we did not know why this was important, but we thought that hematologists would. And so I'm a strong believer in publishing papers in the correct journal. And so we sent this, this, uh, this work to the flagship hematology journal Blood three times, and three times it was not sent out to be reviewed. And so we published it in the Journal of Physical Chemistry B, and as far as we can tell, nobody read it. And so when uh, in 2009, when we moved to UCLA, uh, we stopped doing this work. But uh, a few years ago, uh, Steve Jonas uh, indicated that after his residency, he's an MD, PhD, uh, he was an MD, PhD at UCLA at the time, after his residency, he would join the lab and we started looking for projects that we would uh, work on. And one of the uh, projects that he pitched to the group was to do high throughput cellular therapies. In other words, to transfect hemopoietic stem cells for bone marrow repair in children with diseases like sickle cell or thalassemias. We'll talk about those more in uh, just a little bit, uh, and also for cancer immunotherapies. And in particular, there was a, a paper that had been published uh, by uh, Bob Langer and Dan Anderson, Klaus Jensen at MIT, in which they squeezed cells through a constriction in a microfluidic channel, opening up transient pores and then enabling them to get biomolecular packages uh, into the cells. And so, you know, at that point we said, oh, well, that's what you do uh, with the transient pores. And they faced a problem that their pores would clog after a few thousand cells, which when we realized how many cells we needed, for a, a child for a bone marrow transplant, a uh, 12 kilogram child would need about 1 billion cells. And so the challenge that we posed to the group was, how do you make the channels not clog? And we came up with half a dozen different solutions to that. And going back to that patient-inspired engineering uh, uh, article that I mentioned earlier, uh, the part of this set of experiments that I found most stimulating is the people we work with actually do these uh, bone marrow transplants every day with their patients, uh, Steve and Satir Del Vero, who runs our, our cancer immunotherapy CAR T cell facility, uh, Don Cohn, who's genetic engineering pioneer, Ted Moore, and so forth. Uh, we're really looking at how we can uh, do this and take it all the way to the clinic. And we've brought in the engineering expertise and other expertise uh, that we needed in order to uh, make these experiments work. Okay, so here's a basic idea. Uh, in these diseases where hemoglobin is miscoded, if we can correct the DNA in say 10 to 20% of the bone marrow, we can produce enough of the correct uh, hemoglobin in the patients such that they'll no longer need uh, blood transfusions which lower their length and quality of life. We'll talk about that a little more in a moment. All the same ideas apply in CAR T cell therapy, and we do these experiments in parallel, although I'll talk mostly about the hemoglobinopathies and the hemopoietic stem cells. Okay, and so for sickle cell, there's a single gene mutation largely in, uh, in a people uh, of African descent. There are about 300,000 cases a year the average life expectancy in the US for a sickle cell patient is about 40 years. In Africa, it's 10 years. And so what we would like to be able to do is correct uh, this mutation uh, in the uh, bone marrow selectively. And uh, we'd like to be able to do that while the patient's in the, uh, in the office. And so uh, what Steve gave us as a target was a billion cells in one hour 
and we have to do that safely. So everything uh, that we design here is, is uh, GMP compatible uh, so that we can move uh, quickly and safely to working with patients. And part of the excitement of having these clinical collaborators who've worked on these particular diseases for decades already is that they have the model cells, the animal models, the patient cells, and ultimately the patients who we can work with. Okay, so uh, I mentioned the uh, working, working uh, directly with the patient. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how uh, people try to do this currently. There actually have been uh, some clinical trials already uh, for, not from us, uh, but from uh, gene editing with other techniques. And likewise, we want to be able to uh, take patients' immune cells and train them to target uh, the cancers from which they're suffering. So currently, uh, the, the most prominent method is a viral delivery. Uh, it, we're, the uh, expense here is really uh, based on a university laboratory uh, for an individual dose uh, for a patient in a real clinic, it would be between 500,000 and $2 million. Uh, the uh, really sig most significant uh, disadvantage is that the DNA can go in the wrong place and can trigger a rare cancer and thus endanger the patient. And so at the scale of 300,000 patients a year, this just is not a viable strategy except for the most extreme cases. One can also electrocute cells but particularly for stem cells, that's not a, a great idea. And it has the disadvantage that that kills a lot of the cells or um, uh, damages the properties that they need in order to make the, uh, in order to retain their stemness. Uh, one can also use harsh chemical treatments to open up, uh, open up the cells, uh, but the efficiency, when one gets to harsh enough, uh, the efficiency uh, varies so much. Uh, that that method also turns out to be problematic. Although both these methods are uh, commercially available and there are a few facilities around the world that also are able to do this uh, viral delivery. And our hope is to avoid harsh chemical or physical treatments or using viruses at all and use something analogous to the cell squeezing method uh, that we uh, discussed earlier where we, where we work with the cells uh, gently in order to open up these transient pores to slip in the packages we need, such as CRISPR-Cas9 and some extra uh, molecules that help us get in the nucleus. And so we've really come up with six different ways to do that. I'll just talk about a couple of these as we go. And this really came from a couple of different places. One was posing the challenge to the group and having in my, in my group, we have people from chemistry, physics, math, bioengineering, neuroscience, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, infectious disease, oncology, hematology, and so forth. And it came from those people coming together in teams and saying, here's what we, you know, here's, here's an approach that we, uh, we can try. Uh, a bit uh, more background, our colleague H. R. Tsang, who's going to play uh, uh, an important role in the uh, in, uh, uh, next part of the talk, had been working on capturing circulating tumor cells with what he called nanovelcro. And he noticed that there was penetration of the cells with these needles, it's really ex silica on a surface. And he thought, well, maybe I can use that mechanical penetration to, to deliver a payloads into the cells. And he was able to do that. And he developed these payloads, which use host guest chemistry, selective cross-linking and polymerization to deliver quite large uh, payloads, which can include RNA, DNA, uh, proteins, uh, other uh, molecules uh, in them. And he put those on what's really kind of nano barbed wire. And because this, uh, the sharpness of the silica and the capture of the cells, these payloads, which you can see here in this electron micrograph, are delivered into the cells. But much like if we were to jump on barbed wire, it's easier to get the cells on to the nano Velcro than it is to get them off. And there's a difficulty in removing those cells from the nano Velcro. And so, and he developed the microfluidics and so forth that he needed to make that work. And for completely different reasons, uh, we had developed 
and ability to make shaped periodic structures on the surface. Xiao Bin Zhu is a mechanical engineer who was a postdoc in our group at the time. Now he's a professor at Tongji University in Shanghai and comes back to visit us as part of this collaboration. And what he was doing was making wedding cake structures such that he could study the plasmonic interactions of metal, metal rings and discs on them by controlling the radii and the vertical spacings of these, of these structures that he made on the surface using this uh, polymer uh, sphere and etching lithography. And so he said, well, I can make smooth, sharp needles that should be, easy, should be easier for us to remove cells uh, selectively. And indeed, that's the case. And he showed that he could individually uh, make those needles magnetic and do delivery, or that we can make this a bed of nail structure. Uh, this is work led by Nacho Watanatorn, who was a graduate student in the group, but is now a principal investigator in her own laboratory in Bangkok. Okay. Another idea that we had uh, came, the inspiration came from plasma physics. And that was that when you want to do nuclear fusion in a laboratory, really reproduce the energy source of the sun, one has to go up to millions of degrees, whereas all the materials that we know evaporate at a few thousand degrees. And so the, the solution to that problem is never let the plasma touch the walls of the container. And we said, well, if the cells never touch the walls of the container, then uh, we don't have to risk the channels clogging. And the uh, way we thought of doing that was with acoustics. And so Steve's comment about how, how uh, he thought of uh, using acoustics was when you go to a concert and you can feel the bass on your body uh, with, the, with the beat. And Tony Wong, who gave the lecture last week uh, in the ICANN series, as you heard, uh, developed acoustic fluidics uh, for uh, just this kind of control purpose. And so we said, well, we could mechanically manipulate the cells going down these microfluidic channels. We could do that in parallel with just such simple structures as this. And there are actually two ways of doing this. In one, we run them just down the middle and deform them in place. And the other, we bounce them to the uh, biomolecular packages that we put on the sidewalls electrostatically of the uh, microfluid chambers. And uh, thus far, uh, this one has been uh, more successful. We're able to run at about 12 million cells uh, per channel per hour. And we think this PNAS paper is going to come out today. If not today, then on Monday. Uh, you can read a little bit about uh, the work already on the UCLA newsroom site. Uh, and it's uh, being picked up by some other news outlets there. We think this is a particularly promising method because we also don't have to worry about a pickup of any uh, uh, molecules, other molecules of the uh, uh, coatings here. And the channels can't clog essentially because they're so large. We've never seen them clogged and we've been able to multiplex out to about uh, 10 channels, which is then giving us uh, 120 million uh, cells in an hour. And we think. Uh, multiplexing out to 100 channels should be no problem. And this work's led by uh, Jason Belling, who I show uh, right here, a senior graduate student uh, in the laboratory and uh, trained in physics and immunology. And you can see the cells when the acoustics uh, are turned on bouncing into the wall here. We at first thought we might need to alternate the delivery of the payload and delivery of the cells, but that doesn't turn out to be necessary. And then we measure the viability of the cells, which is very high, and the, the efficiency of the transfection. Uh, it's also important that we get in the nucleus. And so we pulled in a collaborator, Steve Young, whose specialty is, is a nuclear uh, penetration. And we do optical measurements to show that indeed we do uh, get those uh, payloads in the nucleus. Uh, we've done a human uh, peripheral uh, blood mononuclear cells, PBMCs, uh, shown very high viabilities and uh, sufficient efficiency to get us excited. We've done a couple of experiments on hemopoietic stem cells, uh, human hemopoietic stem cells. The uh, 
the cells themselves are quite expensive. So we're tuning up with other, uh, with other cells first uh, before we go back to these, but already very promising at 25 or 30%. Uh, and very high viability such that if we needed to cycle and go another round, we believe we could boost the efficiency uh, quite high. So we see this as a, a promising method. Uh, and again, everything has been a GMP compatible. Uh, so that should help us move towards patients as rapidly as possible. Okay. Uh, well, uh, you know, on the one side, uh, we can work at uh, treating diseases using these cellular therapies. On another, we'd also like to be monitoring diseases through what are called liquid biopsies uh, by looking at what's in the blood, whether they're circulating tumor cells or exosomes or viruses. Uh, we've also used chemical functionalization in order to do that. And as I mentioned earlier, this was a, a collaboration uh, led by uh, Professor Tsang, our, our colleague here and Professor Namjoon Cho at Nanyang Technological University, where we provide the surface functionalization and look at what the target problems are and see how we can solve those. So the idea is that a tumor will shed cells that can be responsible for uh, metastasis or just sometimes uh, just be a marker uh, that we can find in the blood, uh, that we can track uh, what a tumor is doing and uh, see the efficacy of therapies uh, without having to go in and do a physical biopsies uh, over and over in a patient. And so we use rather simple chemistry on the uh, nano velcro that, that uh, Professor Tsang had developed previously. And what we've uh, built in now is a cuttable linkage. And so while we do the chemistry to put in the, the recognition elements for particular circulating tumor cells, and we we uh, target a particular cancer where uh, biomarkers are known here in a, a lung cancer. Uh, we also build in a chemical structure where when we want to release a cell, uh, we can cut that. And this is now going down to the point, I, I won't be able to show you the work today, uh, but we've gotten this to the point where we can test and measure the biomarkers in individual cells. And then we, we believe we have a mechanism by which we can release those individual cells uh, for uh, further study. And so we can go again one by one and study the heterogeneity in these systems that we said was so important in uh, nanoscience and biology. Um, here's uh, you know, further work showing uh, how we're able to uh, do this release and how we're able to associate the uh, therapeutic uh, efficiency or efficacy, I should say, of treatment and track over time as a uh, uh, patient's uh, treatment uh, develops. Okay. Uh, and then for exosomes, these are more like the uh, vesicles that I showed earlier. Those aren't as robust as the circulating tumor cells. And so one can't uh, be as rough with them as the nanovelcro. So what we try to do is mimic the villi that are in your intestines the sort of forest uh, and uh, do that in order to capture the exosomes within that forest by again, using a chemistry that gives us specific recognition of the ones we're looking for uh, with uh, biomarkers that we have in place. And you can read about that in this paper we published uh, this last year. Okay, uh, and this work's continuing uh, where we uh, have done a similar work for viruses uh, as we develop uh, biomarkers, we can develop the tools to uh, capture those. Uh, there's some particular uh, circulating tumor cells with, with very known functionality on the surface on which we're uh, building the system. And then as we know more and more about other diseases, we'll be able to translate those, we hope, fairly rapidly into uh, useful uh, technology and diagnostic. So I, I try to take you through those, those three stories. There are more in tissue engineering uh, that we can save uh, for another day. Uh, but the basic idea we've had is to see where it is we can contribute, uh, where this ability to place chemical functionality and add that fourth dimension to lithography can be of value, and then see if we can work with the, work with the people who are working with either patients 
or in uh, the case of Professor Andrews, uh, going after fundamental studies of the brain to take these as quickly as possible uh, to uh, functional and useful uh, measurements and control. Uh, I try to put everyone's name in every slide as we went along. Uh, we have collaborators around the world. Uh, we miss you and we'll look forward to uh, catching up with you when uh, this time is over. Uh, in the meantime, Alice, thank you for putting this together. Uh, here are the people who paid for all this, uh, particularly uh, NIH in the uh, brain work. Uh, Professor Andrews has this uh, director's award and in the, in the acoustic fluidics, uh, Steve Jonas also has an award from the director of the NIH uh, that funds that work. And a whole series of foundations have come in uh, to help us and get us started before we had any data. Uh, one of the last, uh, really the last thing I'd like to say is, you know, I, I, I think what we've learned over time is if you're curious, you can look for these refractory or at least unsolved problems, and you'll find a series of like-minded people who will have very different skills. And you can teach each other those skills and the approaches and even the targets, as you saw uh, throughout those, uh, these talks. And you'll have a bigger audience by doing that. And you'll learn a lot of the fundamentals that you'll need you know, along the way. This is a self-selecting group. And so it'll, it'll keep growing. This is something we're doing at UCLA now. And we'll expand to other universities beyond you know, our research group. And in terms of training, uh, students, postdocs, uh, junior and senior faculty, this is really an incredible educational opportunity uh, to learn something new and to be able to uh, really to do, do something nobody else can or nobody else could in an individual laboratory. So what I'd suggest to the students and postdocs out there is to choose the problem that gets you out of bed every morning and go after that and find the, the, the places and opportunities where you can do that and don't be afraid to pitch ideas. Uh, when I first got started in my academic career, no one was doing what we were doing. Uh, we just had to go off on our own. That meant we had a fairly small audience, but on the other hand, we had a completely unexplored universe uh, to go after. And then as we developed these new tools and new skills, we were uh, picked up uh, by, by others. So thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Paul. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Next, uh, we will pick some uh, questions from audience. Here it is on the screen, yeah. Yes, okay. Hello, um, Paul. We will pick uh, several questions from the audience. Yes. Um, the first one is from uh, Professor Jason Chiu uh, uh, from Beijing University of Chemical Technology. Uh, he, he actually has uh, two questions. First question, are there any nano medicine or nano materials that can be used to test and diagnose novel coronavirus? The COVID-19 quickly and accurately with this, we can stop the spread of the COVID-19. Yeah, this is the first, we can yes. this is the, the first part first. Well, I certainly think there can be. Let's uh, put it that way. You know, there we know uh, the complete sequence, and so all the techniques we use for RNA detection are uh, available to us. You know, the sequence was published very early, and uh, sorry, that's a cat who enjoys Zoom meetings very much. Uh, yeah, uh, the uh, all the techniques we have uh, are available. So I would say the laboratories uh, that are able to do RNA detection. Uh, can apply their particular tools and strategies. Uh, the one that I showed you, we think would be uh, would be uh, useful in that regard. So we're just trying to put that together ourselves. Okay, thank you. So let's see the next. Hello, please show. Is there? Okay. Uh, second question. Um, uh, it's a question for, uh, from uh, me. Okay, he's from Harvey Institute of Technology. The smallest mystery is our body in nature. What are the most significant challenges do you think for the biosensor if we plan to explore more? 
Yeah. Okay. So that's a great question. So the, uh, you know, the idea is we can develop uh, sensors for the molecules we know, but there are many that we don't know, right? For instance, in the brain, there are a hundred chemical signaling molecules that we know, but there may well be others, right? There have been discoveries over many years. So if we don't, uh, if we don't know they're there, uh, then they're, they're holes. And so this is a problem that really needs to bring together chemists and measurement scientists and neuroscientists and other problems. And that, that uh, same idea is repeated by analogy in all the different systems we want to study, such as the microbiome. You know, so for uh, the oral microbiome, we know the top two or 300 uh, species that are in our mouth. And it turns out people have been able to measure most of the signaling molecules and work out the biological pathways for those. But on other systems, for instance, our skin, right? We have heterogeneity across our individual bodies and heterogeneity between us. And we don't know those systems well. In the gut microbiome, right, it's less accessible to us if you know what I mean. <laughs> and so uh, there's spatial heterogeneity and temporal heterogeneity and responses to what we eat and do. And that's a very important system uh, for our health. In uh, vaginal microbiome, there are, women fall into uh, four different categories, uh, essentially, in terms of how they respond over time and, and so forth. And so something is known there uh, in agriculture. Right, the uh, the microbiome is incredibly important for the uh, healthy growth of plants and prevention of disease. And so they're 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 missing pieces, I would say. And in each case, we're really just getting started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The senses will bring us a, a wonderful, wonderful future. Yes. Okay. Then we will see the next question. So. The, uh, uh, yeah, also a great question. So what's the biophysics of the pores? Okay, <laughs> great. Do you want to read it or shall we? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so uh, the answer is uh, we don't know. It was a surprise when we found it. Uh, to date, we've used it, um, you know, we've used it to advantage as have others, uh, like you know, the uh, group at MIT. Uh, we would like to know uh, how they're formed and how we can control them because that would enable us to do better in terms of delivery. But yeah, absolutely, we can get things through through uh, pores. Uh, one of the most interesting things to me when we started working on membranes was uh, that we knew how important the domain boundaries were in the flat monolayers. And we also know there are domain boundaries in cell membranes that there are enzymes, lipases that'll sit there and chew. And so we had a quite a degree of confidence that would be an important problem when we started. So, uh, you know, from, from that point of view, but the transient pores is a very interesting biophysics problem. And I actually have a graduate student using this time of shelter in place in order to design a whole series of experiments to, to uh, test that. Okay, so let's see uh, next question. Okay, let's see if we read Oh yeah. So also an excellent question. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, I saw, uh, sir. Can you can you can you see? I really it's too small for me to see. Oh yeah, no. I I uh, if you go to the uh, Alice's uh, screen, then we're both in front of it. Hopefully yes, that's okay. the same broadcast. <laughs> yes, okay. Yeah. So, so, the, uh, so the false the, question. Uh, the question is, if uh, the advantages of the Aptmer uh, field effect transistors over other sensors, well, the advantages yes. have a very wide dynamic range. Uh, they're very flexible. We've been able to make them work in vivo. Uh, we don't need to get light in or out of the body, which is a big advantage. Uh, one knows, although we have not yet developed, uh, the ability to multiplex these. Uh, one of our colleagues, Satiris Masmonitis uh, at UCLA, has done electrical measurements of 5,000 pads at a time. 
And so if we replace those pads uh, for in vivo measurements, if we replace those pads with the field effect transistors, then we believe we can uh, multiplex uh, those. Uh, so uh, the limit I would say in these uh, devices is the ability to select aptamers. So Professor Stojanovich has really been a key, uh, you know, a key collaborator uh, in that sense. We'd worked for many years before with, with others trying to develop aptamers who had not succeeded. And so when he uh, came onto the project, uh, not only was he able to develop the aptamers, but he was able to make them uh, selectively such that we'd see that motion close to the surface. And so uh, it was really a combination of both the sensitivity and how they function that, uh, that gives us our big advantage here. Okay, let's see. Okay, the fifth question is uh, uh, from uh, Zheng Han in Zhejiang University. Uh, hi, P Professor Weiss, thank you for your inspiring talk. I'm quite interested in the problem of the microbiomes with the sensor array you mentioned, but I'm wondering how to detect the microbiota with biosensors, for example, in the human gut, since uh, the microbiome. Uh, could be very complicated. Besides, what do you think about the main yes. challenges for biases? Okay, so uh, I agree that, as I said, the gut is less accessible. And there are people who've made, for instance, swallowable sensors, uh, Karush uh, Klenter Zadeh at uh, UNSW uh, has a system that'll pass through the gut and give feedback that way. Our particular strategy is to say, Lots of people are looking at the gut. Let's look at more accessible systems. So our initial interest is in the oral microbiome where there are incredibly important uh, problems there. Uh, that's why Ali Reza Moshe Verini was on the slide. I didn't have a chance to talk about the work we're trying to do together, but by knowing all the signaling molecules in the mouth, we can identify the species that are there. Some are harmful. They give us cavities. Or with, if we have a surgical implant, they chew around it and it falls out. And dentists and periodontists and prosthodontists know this, but they don't currently have any reconnaissance. And so if we can tell someone that they have this species in their mouth, we can, for instance, delay a surgery. Or what our uh, former colleague, uh, did, uh, when one she did, uh, was say, okay, you have a species in your mouth that gives you cavities, we'll get rid of that one and grow the protective species that excludes the main species that gives you cavities. And so he developed a lollipop uh, that let uh, people get rid of the cavity producing species. And so for me, uh, you know, I see an advantage in the more accessible microbiomes than the gut. So I have circumvented the question, uh, but that's the, that's the approach we took in the laboratory. I figure lots of people are looking at the gut, not so many people are looking at other microbiomes and their important and interesting problems. Sometimes it's in, not only important to choose what problems to approach, it's also important to choose what problems not to approach. So my father's field was probability and that one minus P is always a very valuable concept that I try to apply to our work as well. Okay, thank you, Paul. So let's see if there are any more questions. Uh, yeah, we chose five. Okay, okay, then we'll finish our task. Thank you very much Hi, for your wonderful talk, Paul. Oh, so thank you so much for the invitation <laughs> and the opportunity. Uh, okay. I mentioned to some people, this is both the earliest and latest talk I've ever given. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let's uh, let's okay, here see comes you. Alice. Let's, let's see Alice. Yeah. Okay, great. Paul, we are so proud of you. Yeah. So I know you know since last night, maybe you're sleeping. Yeah. So we do double check online several times. And then Paul, yeah, it's very hard working for making all the slides it looks perfect. It's very nice. Paul, I'm a proud of you. Uh, it's our great honor to deliver this, you know, special certification to you. Yeah, for your wonderful talk. 
<laughs> you high tech connect the whole world and the universe. How with for the nanotech approach to biology and medicine? That's for you, Paul. Thank you so much. <laughs> it is great. Yeah. So I think you know. Yeah, we have a really really great time. So yeah, now I make few you know announcements on this. And uh, first is for the rising stars. For all of our ACS Nano group here, yeah, I think it's a great honor to, you know, have this Rising Stars lecture on, uh, you know, on I can act because I can act talks is, uh, you know, really want to make all people's feelings, you know, uh, you can share everything with the whole world. And uh, for this Rising Star lectures, uh, is working together with all these. Uh, ACS Nano Top Scientist Group. We will do it like, you know, and uh, June 12th. So the introduce the young scientists, the rising star, introduced by all these senior scientists, right? The added form, right? Paul, is that the idea? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we're hoping we have the relevant editor, although we have to figure out where they are in the world, or uh, advisor or senior scientists do an introduction. Uh, very much the way those of you who've been to thesis defenses in Scandinavia know about uh, the opponent there who puts the work in context briefly in addition to the, the uh, normal uh, academic introduction. So yeah, very short sure talk, is. but something that says uh, talks about the field. <laughs> That's really, really good. I think this time, you know, we do this lively, you know, interactive discussions on the same stage. It's a very good experience. So we'll continue that. And it's rising star lectures. So yeah, we continue, you know, to get some more discussions, share more experience and all these things to come out. I think I can add this uh, stage for all these kind of new things. Yeah new technology and the new kind of innovations, everything on this stage. So thanks Paul and your top group on this, you know, I can X tax. This was really a day for I can X AC Nano thing. We're looking forward to the rising star day, the rising star lectures. Thank you all. Yeah, that's my first uh, you know highlight. So keep on I can X, you know, talks. We will have this young generations again on the stage. Yeah, next day is for another young generations get on stage. It's an event for mine we ran for several years. Choose a young scientist, you know, worldwide. Well, uh, this time I choose four of them to get on the stage to share as at June fifth. So they will deliver the talk the in microsystem and nano engineering. So last week I think I was already, you know, deliver this message because now it's calling for the my young scientist awards the candidate. So this uh, word is uh, uh, sponsored by the Microsystem and Nano Engineering the journals. Yeah, but I was, uh, you know, be the chair for several years of this Young Scientist Award. So I always, you know, try to promote, promote. Yeah, please join us. This is a very open, open stage. And uh, to get all your materials prepared, ready, you can nominate by the, you know, senior scientists. You also can self-nominate. Yeah, that's all welcome. The main idea for this Young Scientist Award is to try to get more people, you know, on the stage to show your latest work. So this will be uh, uh, ongoing and uh, be sure to submit your materials on time and we will do that later. Okay, yeah, that's two advertisement for these young generations. Remember, keep in mind, you know, I can ask the talks is a stage not only for the senior scientists it's also for the junior scientists if you have something to show if you have the latest you know kind of inform, uh, technique information innovations this stage is for you so the whole world is for you so be sure be brave enough you know to jump in yeah, to dive in, in this new world. That's exactly the welcome message from I can add talks. And uh, next week, we will have two talk scientists. One was Nico Fong, as uh, from uh, MIT. You know, he's very famous for the nanofabrications, do a lot of nice works. And the Xiu Ling Li, 
uh, is one of uh, the uh, most famous lady scientists I was admired for many years. Yeah, she graduated from Peking University, same school from uh, Professor Yan, Yan Li, you know, that's alumni. Yeah, <laughs> outstanding alumni from uh, uh, PKU's chemistry school. So he's just doing so well. And she's a silver speaker. She will get on stage, you know, next week. So we're looking forward to May 8th. And uh, the last day I will show the ace. Oh, yeah, we be sure, be proud of, uh, you know, we have such a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, a waiting list uh, to get on the I can X talks. So we uh, invited all these famous scientists that they want to show. We also open for the scientists who going to want to show to others. You can send your information to us. We will see uh, if it's suitable. Uh, you know, we have a portable uh, uh, sort of pipeline to will get you in. So on this screen, we'll see that all scientists from the whole world, uh, yeah, it's everyone. Yeah, you will listen to the talk, so you will, you know, meet the all these super persons. I can't see it's right, you know, the stage for you. So today, yeah, I'm uh, so proud of uh, uh, all these, you know, top scientists, the leaders, they a whole, you know, three hours with us on the questions, the deliver talks, and uh, do something new, you know, we try something new on this stage. That's really, really good. In the last, I want to tell everyone, I'm proud of, you know, and this holiday time, you know, how many audience we attract on this stage? Huh? Yeah. We are proud, we're really proud of the numbers. At this stage, till now we have, you know, I can actually talk the platform to, you know, uh, push out all these messages. We also get to uh, 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 collaborate with several other academic platforms. The totally we have now is 12,000 people. You know, here's the holidays, so later night or early morning, uh, even from uh, the whole world, is it decent to our talks? Yeah, you see the questions were from all over the world, everywhere, you know, science, uh, you know different university science. So we are so proud of you. Yeah, that's a May Day, the International Labor Day. But all the scientists, the, all the academic people are working hard. Yeah, we share to everyone. Okay, now it's time to say bye bye. I go to see you next week. Uh, I can ask the talks, connect the world and the universe. Okay, bye bye. Bye, bye. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, bye -bye. you Alice. Thank yeah, you, we'll see you next week. Bye. bye everyone. Great day. Talk to you in half an hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, Never yeah. Heard of